Hey guys, welcome back to In The Shop TV. This is my 1955 Chevy truck project and today we're getting some work done back on this frame again. So guys, make sure you tune into the end of the video because I'm sure I'm gonna miss some stuff while I'm actually working away and welding. And I'm gonna kind of go over a summary at the end and kind of just make a list of some basic things that you need to follow or pay attention to if you've never welded before and you wanna tackle something like this yourself. I know when I first started working on cars when I was a kid, welding always put me off to being able to do this fully because I couldn't weld, didn't have access to a welding machine and it meant money, right? Because I had to take my car someplace to a fab shop or a restoration shop or somebody knew how to weld and you know, there's always just some welding involved in working on classic cars. I got myself a welding machine uh, years ago. I started practicing, by no means a pro. Point of this video is I want you guys to know that if you're at all held back or if you guys feel prohibited from fully restoring a car from the frame up or whatever the level of restoration you're doing, because you can't weld or you don't have a welding machine, I'm here to let you guys know that you can do this stuff. You can weld, you can fix a frame, you can fix sheet metal. It's just practice and you don't have to spend a ton of money. I'll show you what we got going on here today. We're getting ready to put an independent front suspension in here, which means that there's another cross member going in. I have it marked actually right here. We have to box in, meaning we have to put a piece of metal here on the C channel and the same thing on this side. Now, if you notice, we've got this big ugly hump right here. This was an indentation that they put from the factory for the steering box. The steering box was just kind of in the way of the frame. They bent the frame up from the factory to, to clearance for the steering box. That's not gonna fly with our independent front suspension. So what we gotta do is we have to cut this out. I've marked where I wanna cut it. And then we're gonna weld in a new piece. you have to have really clean metal so you get proper penetration. If not, the weld gets contaminated with all types of crud and it looks really bad and you might get porosity, which is like little holes in the weld. So what we're gonna do is take a wire wheel and we're gonna clean down this cut area. Nice and clean. So guys, a flap disc or an abrasive wheel would also work really well in this situation. But since this is our frame, I don't wanna remove too much material. An abrasive wheel will actually take some of this metal down. I just wanted to get all the paint and crud and mill scale and rust off of here so that we would have just clean bare metal to work with. The next thing that I want to do is um, I want to put a bevel on my cut. Oh, I still have my stylus glasses on here. Don't be jealous, guys, all right? It'll allow the weld material to penetrate better in between both pieces of metal. So hopefully you guys picked this up on camera. Um, there's just a little bit of an edge we ground into it. Yeah, you can kind of see it better there in the light. The next thing we're gonna do is we have our piece of flat stock right here. This is just some basic 1 8 inch that I got that we're gonna use as our filler piece. Um, the actual frame is closer to 10 gauge, which is just a hair thicker than our 1 8. So here's our frame. And if we go to 1 8 on our filler gauge, it doesn't quite fit in there. But if I jump down to 10 gauge, that's where it starts to slide in. But you know, if I line these two pieces up next to each other, I mean, I cannot feel a difference in thickness from my thumb and my pointer finger on the bottom. I mean, they both kind of line up, so it's very, very, very close. All right, so we're all clamped in. I have these um, metal marking welder's pencils here. I'm just gonna go ahead and trace out my piece. Take it over there and get it fit up. Moment of truth. Let's see. Okay, I like it on this side. That's where we need it to be. Got a little bit of a gap over there. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to trim a little bit out of this corner right here, just so I don't have that piece sticking out how I did. This piece, we can still see the red line is what we gotta shave off so that it lays back down and then we can get this corner to tuck in a little bit. All right, guys, I am pretty happy with that fit up. We got just enough of a gap to weld. Our ends are tucked in nice. Um, I think it's looking pretty good. So we're gonna do the same thing to this piece. We're gonna go ahead and put a bevel on this end. All right guys, so I have our piece um, held in place with two magnets right here. Um, there's another step I need to do before I weld this in 
which is this piece is covered in mill scale, which is basically just a covering from the factory. Um, and you really want to get that all off of there before you put your final weld on. But for right now, I'm going to go ahead and just put a couple of tacks where I have my beveled edges nice and clean just to hold it in place and get it set. Then I'll come back with the wire wheel and clean all the mill scale off. Remember, you always want to take your ground and clamp it to a nice, good, clean piece of metal so that you get a good connection. So we're gonna come in on the side over here, kind of where, I don't wanna to get too close to where we have to weld, but as long as we're getting some of that nice clean metal. The side's kind of starting to curl up a little bit on our piece, as you can see. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. So what I'm gonna do is push this down and shoot another tack over here to kind of hold that in position. Perfect. Because I'm going to lay short beads at a time, I'm not gonna, meaning I'm not going to run the whole length of the piece in one weld. Um, that could put a considerable amount of heat into the, into the frame and um, possibly cause some warping and some bending. So I don't want to do that. I'm going to lay maybe like two or three inch sections of beads down at a time, stop, check, and assess what we've done, see if there's any movement, see if there's any warpage, and so we can make corrections from there. It's better to do little pieces at a time so that you can correct anything as it occurs. I think we're getting good tying and everything is good. What I don't like is that it's a little too convex, which could be our setting, but I think really what's happening here is that I'm going a little bit too slow with my weld. So this is gonna be fine, it's gonna hold great, it's gonna grind down nice and smooth, but it's more grinding when you have that kind of high dome on it. So I think I'm gonna start, I'm gonna move my weld a little bit quicker so we don't get as much of a dome. So I actually turned up the heat just a little bit to find that sweet spot, and I think we're a lot better here. I was making a little bit of a mistake. Um, I was kind of not staying in front of the puddle. You always want to have your material, or your stick out rather, your wire, leading on the leading edge of the puddle. Um, and that'll give you a nice bead, which is what we got here. Um, I didn't do that on these other welds, and they kind of piled up on me. So I'm gonna stick with this setting, and remember to stay on the leading edge of the puddle. And I think we'll be all right. Um, I didn't stay on a continuous weld at the end because our piece that we're welding has this really sharp point on it. It becomes not really one eighth anymore if you think about it. It's just a tiny little sliver of metal and all this heat and penetration can just kind of blow it off. So I'm going to stop short on this last bead, probably where this tack is. I'm going to go from here to here lay down a nice bead and then stop short and I'm probably gonna just kind of stitch weld in with little tacks until I get to the end. You always wanna keep your stick out length trimmed to about three eighths of an inch. Clip your wire every time you start your weld. All right guys, I don't know about you, but I am pretty happy with that. It's like it never was. All right guys, so I'm gonna shoot a little bit of uh, black paint down just to keep it from rusting. It's not gonna be a paint job that we're gonna keep here permanently, but just to keep the rust from forming because it will form pretty fast on this mild steel. All right, so the paint is dry and you can't really see where it was, which is uh, pretty much the goal. You can see where we started you know, grinding some of the paint and grime away because it's smooth here and kind of rough and textured over here. Same thing right there. You get, you know, some rough texture and it's nice and smooth here. That's pretty good in my book. All right, guys, so a couple things I wanted to talk about in summary. Number one, welding machines, okay? Um, as of the time of shooting this video, I went online and looked at a couple welding machines. You don't have to spend big bucks. Um, I saw everything from 350 to about a thousand bucks um, for something decent to start out with. Um, at the lower end of that, on 350, uh, there's a company called Eastwood. They're, you know, really centered around all this automotive restoration stuff. They have good products. Um, and they can get their um, entry-level MIG machine for 
I think it was like 359 or something like that. From there on up, you've got two from Harbor Freight. You've got a Titanium, which has actually got really good reviews. Um, if you get one for 449, I believe it is. From there on up, you can go to, I think, uh, like a Hobart or, or something like that. A Hobart 140 is a really good machine. I think they're around 600 bucks. And then back to Harbor Freight again, they have a MIG Max 215, which is a really great MIG welder. And it has auto set, that same feature where you can kind of just kind of dial in your material thickness and your wire and all that, and it'll shoot you out a generic setting. Um, that was, I think, 900 and something bucks at the time of shooting this video. In addition to, if you, if you get a machine that does not come with that auto set feature where you just kind of dial everything in to give you the generic setting, all these welding machines are gonna come with um, a guide when you open the door where you put your wire in, there's gonna be a guide printed in there that gives you um, specifications on how to set your um, voltage and wire speed. So um, they're usually pretty close, honestly. Um, in my experience, they tend to be a little bit on the conservative side. Um, and so you may wanna crank it a little bit more than what they say, but um, they are a really good starting point for you to get dialed in and, and kind of not spend a lot of time um, ruining a lot of stuff and going through material and welding wire trying to figure it out. So use the guide. Next thing I wanna talk about, gas or flux. Okay, so I'm using MIG gas right now, it's known as 7525, or sometimes they call it C25. It's a mix of CO2 and argon, um, and that's specifically for MIG welding. What it does is a shielding gas, right? It covers your wire so you don't get contamination when you're laying down your weld. Uh, really important to get a nice clean um, weld bead. Now, you can get even cheaper machines than this, and they are what's called flux core machines. Um, the wire that comes from a flux core has just what it sounds like, this core of the wire has a flux in it that acts in the same way that the shielding gas does and that it protects the weld material from becoming contaminated. Um, they are a bit messier and a bit more crude to work with. Um, you'll, there'll be a lot of splatter when you're welding. You'll see the little welding beads going all over the place. There's a lot of staining and you gotta kinda go over with a wire brush. Not the end of the world. Um, it doesn't typically make as pretty of a bead. Um, if you're grinding it all off, it doesn't really matter anyway, and this is not fancy welding here. So um, it's not terribly bad, but it's just extra work. Um, but if that's all that you can afford by any means, don't be afraid to use a flux core machine. Um, they are considerably less expensive, and they will get the job done. All right, number three, this is a really important one that's often overlooked even by people that weld often. Your hood, right? Um, the hood that you wear makes a really big difference in how you weld and it took me embarrassingly a long time to figure that out um, My first welding helmet was a cheapie from Harbor Freight. I think I paid like 34 or 36 bucks from it um, It's an auto darkening meaning as soon as you strike that arc it goes dark So that all you can see is the, the actual arc itself You really can't weld very well if you can't see what you're welding and that was the problem that I was having um, My welds looked like crap um, I'd kind of rainbow weld like you know, I'd have You'd have your seam here, and then my weld would start going up like that and missing the, the joint altogether. Um, so yeah, you can't weld if you can't see. So um, don't cheap out on the hood. It's also, you, you've heard of getting flash. You don't want to look at that arc. That hood will protect your eyes from getting a flash. If you've ever caught a welding flash, I used to work with a welder, a professional welder, um, your eyes will be in pain for days and days and days, and they'll be red and puffy and teary, and you don't want that. You got to protect yourself. Always take care of yourself. Wear a respirator if you can. Um, a good hood is essential, guys, if you're gonna weld. It's don't, that's the one place where you don't wanna cheap out. That said, you don't have to spend 400 bucks on a, on a name brand, you know, Lincoln or Miller hood. There are really good hoods out there that will you know, um, do just what they do for a much less uh, expensive price tag. Harbor Freight has one, it's called Vulcan um, Auto Darkening Helmet. It's really, really good, very comfortable. It's actually modeled after the Lincoln um, Auto Darkening Helmet, which is, I think, Personally, one of the best. Number four, this might seem like an obvious one to some people, but um, it is not always obvious. Practice, okay? You guys can go to any of your local metal supply places. Most of them will have tons of scrap laying around that they will give you free of charge or for a very slight nominal fee that you can practice on in varying gauges and thicknesses, which is a really good thing. It'll help you like kind of dial in what you're trying to do. So, um, <laughs> You can go to the places that aren't so um, gratuitous and giving you scrap. I mean, I used to live in New York up north and you know, they charge you for breathing air up there. So um, the welding shop that I, or the metal shop that I used to go to, they charged me for what they call the scrap pack. And I think it was like 15 bucks and it was just a whole bunch of 
four by four cuttings of sheet of steel in varying thicknesses. And I just sat there one day and I just welded and welded and welded on those until I like really kind of started figuring out what I was doing. Um, so you don't want to start practicing right on the workpiece on your chassis or your auto body or whatever it is, because, um, well, you don't want to mess that up. You don't get a lot of shots at doing that right. So get scrap, weld your little brains out on it. And, um, and that's how you'll, you'll really start to figure things out is by practicing. Also, you know, right here on YouTube, there's a ton of great information on welding. Um, I, I'm not ashamed to say that I was on YouTube. I learned a lot. I watched a lot of videos. And I got to tell you, the information that you can get for free on YouTube, it blows my mind because there's, you know, trade schools teaching this type of stuff that you can pay a lot of money for. Um, and you can learn to weld by watching YouTube videos. I'm not saying you're going to be the best welder in the world or you're going to be a pro. Maybe you will. I don't know. But um, there's a real world difference between being the best welder in the world and being a functional welder that can get stuff done. Um, stay off the forums. They'll tell you that, you know, if you don't lay a perfect stack of dime beads, that, you know, you're just, you know, abysmal and you should just jump off a bridge and not call yourself a welder and, and all that type of stuff. Don't pay any attention to that stuff. Um, you'll learn what you need to do to lay down a good bead and get good penetration and make a solid weld. And that's really what's important. Okay, number five, you've got your welding machine, you've got your hood, you got all your stuff picked out, you're ready to go, you've practiced, you're ready to start welding on your actual material now or your workpiece. Um, what's number five? Be conservative. What do I mean by that? Okay, so you go to start laying down your first weld. Um, what you usually you're gonna wanna do if you're putting a piece to another piece is you're gonna wanna tack it in place. Tacking is just that quick, psh, you know, laying down a quick little spot weld and holding something there. Um, metal does funny things when you start welding it and applying heat to it. Um, if you tack something on one end, what'll happen is you get that rapid expansion from the heat and then as that weld cools, it contracts. As it contracts, it will draw that metal in with it. So if you have a long piece of metal that you tack welded on one side, the other side of the metal is going to want to lift up on you. Okay, so it's really important to not, what I mean by be conservative is don't take your welding gun and, shh, and lay down a whole bead across the whole piece because you will get some distortion and warping and all that. Um, it's just, especially on automotive, there's nothing that's really, really heavy duty, heavy gauge steel on here. I mean, this frame's pretty beefy and I think we're at, I think what did I say, 10 gauge or it's almost 3 16 actually thick, which is, is pretty beefy. Um, that's really pretty much all you're gonna see. Maybe you'll see some motor mounts or some leaf spring perches that are thicker, but it's not, nothing's getting quarter, thicker than a quarter of an inch on here, guys. So um, this stuff will warp if you put a lot of heat to it. So be conservative when you're welding. Little tacks. Even that piece that I welded in there that you guys saw earlier in the video, you could have stitch welded that whole thing in with tacks if you wanted to. You don't have to lay a continuous bead. Um, so be conservative with it. Don't lay down these big fat long beads and just go full bore um, right from the start. You know, take your time, baby steps, um, and just pay attention. Like you'll look for that warpage, start on one end. When you see the metal lift, which it will, or it'll pull in. Even if you don't see it, then go to the other end after you do your first tack and put a tack on that side kind of counterbalance that type of warpage and shrinkage and all type of stuff. So be conservative guys, don't go full full on crazy when you first start welding, all right? Number six, comfort. You wanna be comfortable when you weld. Um, if you're really in a contorted position, your welds are gonna kinda of come up messed up. I mean, it's um, it's just the nature of the beast. So get yourself comfortable first. I mean, even if you, you look like an idiot just sitting there, finding the right spot to hold your arms and to hold the gun and, and that type of stuff, it's worth it. Um, another thing that I'll do, talk about comfort, is I'll kind of mock weld. I'll take that gun, I'll make my little circle ease, and I'll you know just get kind of muscle memory down um, a couple times without pulling the trigger. I'll just keep doing it until I, I figure out how I want to lay that bead down. You know, maybe the third or fourth time I'll go ahead and pull the trigger, but I don't want to start actually welding until I'm physically comfortable because it will show. Um, that you'll have a sloppy weld and um, you just, it, it, be comfortable. Part of that is breathing. <laughs> Believe it or not, when I first started welding, um, I don't know why I did this, but I held my breath as I was actually welding. And um, it makes you kind of jumpy for some reason. You, it unsteadies your hand. Be, you know, Breathing is part of being comfortable, guys. Just sit there and you're not going to hurt yourself if you follow all the safety rules and have your hood on and all that. Remember to breathe and your welding will come out a lot better. As stupid as that sounds, it's really true. All right, by now I know, I know I'm losing some of you guys and this is really getting boring. I'm almost done, I promise. Number seven, critique, all right? You are your biggest critic, so look at your weld. Stop 
when you lay down that first bead or a couple tacks, look at them. What do you see? Do you see, you know, something like this where uh, your weld surface is here and the welding bead is kind of really high and dome shaped like that? Well, that can mean a couple things. Maybe, maybe your settings are too cold, right? So you've got to go ahead and adjust your machine to make it a little bit hotter. Maybe you're staying, you're traveling um, too slow and the weld is kind of just building up and pooling. So you're getting a higher weld. Um, so pay attention to that type of stuff. Look at what you're actually doing, what it looks like, and think about it and say, huh, what do I need to do to get this to be, you know, more of a, uh, a smooth welding bead? Because what happens is when you have this big hump of weld here, you know, you don't get a lot of cut in on the sides. Um, it's a lot of grinding to get that smooth. Uh, it's just a mess and you don't want to be breathing and all that grinding does for too long. So stop frequently and check out your weld and be your biggest critic. All right, just about done here. Last one, and I probably should have put this one a lot earlier in the list, but number eight is ground slash safety. Um, obviously, you are short circuit MIG welding, right? So you're creating a short, basically. Um, so your ground connection has to be really, really good. You don't want to be putting your ground clamp over painted metal or anything like that. Um, you want it to be on nice, clean, fresh metal so that you get the best connection possible. Um, also, be cognizant of what you are doing. You are short-circuiting electricity. So, um, and in my case, it's 240 volts, not 120. So, you really want to be careful. Um, you want to wear gloves all the time. If you're wearing leather gloves, you're going to be fine. You should be wearing leather gloves when you're welding anyway. I see a lot of um, restoration shows on TV and they're just welding with bare hands and all that. Don't do that. There's no reason for that. You're going to hurt yourself. Um, you could burn yourself. and Something that people never think about is you're gonna get UV exposure. All that bright arc flash is, it causes UV um, exposure to your skin. And you gotta take care of yourself, guys. Always take care of yourself. It's the most important thing. This is all for fun. This is all hobbies, right? You gotta take care of your health. That's you know priority one. So um, we got eight things here for you guys to consider. I'm sure I'm missing a whole bunch of stuff when it comes to this. I'm sorry for rambling on and on in this video. I like to keep my videos more about action and showing you what I'm actually doing rather than talking and boring you to death. But with something like this, I just, I know when I started getting into all this type of stuff, getting into cars when I was a kid, I was like, man, you know, I can't weld. So I was just, this is out of reach for me. And there's set things that I'm not gonna be able to do and I have to pay all this money. If you are attempting any level of auto restoration, you can weld, you can do this. It's not that difficult, guys. Um, you don't have to be a pro. You don't have to be the best welder in the world, um, despite what they say on the welding forums and all that. Um, you can totally do this. It's not brain surgery. So I encourage you guys get out there and try go get a welding machine practice Don't have to spend a fortune um, Really a couple hundred bucks and, and you're off and running um, Gas if you want to get mid gas if you don't want to use flux core, I recommend that for automotive um, You can go to like your tractor supply or whatever and they have like rental programs You can rent the bottle and it's not very expensive um, I'm not sure what it is. I actually own this bottle. So to refill it is only like 20 or 30 bucks and then they just kind of, it's like propane, like for your gas uh, grill, right? When you're grilling outside, you just kind of swap tanks when you're done and it's not that expensive, but it's totally worth it. In my opinion, if you're gonna be doing automotive work, you wanna have, you really wanna have gas, but not to discourage you from flux core, you can use it, it's fine. It's just more work and it's not as pretty, it's a little more, more messy. All right, guys, well, I've got a big mess to clean up. If you're still sitting here this whole time with me, I really, really want you to know I appreciate it. It means a lot to me. Um, thank you to all the new subscribers that we have. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate you guys too, and I hope you're looking forward to a lot of projects coming up. Um, we've got an entire 55 Chevy truck to build, and we've got my wife's C3 75 Corvette sitting over there in the corner looking all sad. That uh, I think I need to start showing that some love pretty soon because, uh, well, I just feel bad for it sitting there while the 55 gets all alone. So maybe we'll do that in the next video. Maybe we'll get on the, the Corvette. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But there's a lot of stuff coming, guys. So thanks for being here, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.